Yay Networks. Welcome back. We're back in my purple chair. The chair that began it all. In front of our ugly brown curtains, <laughs> right back where we started this podcast. This is the final episode of Gentle Mayhem Season 1, and we thought it would be really fun to take a look back at some of our best, weirdest, funniest moments from this podcast. That's going to be good. It's, it's a whole year to work with. It's like basically... It's amazing for you because you're getting a highlight reel without having to watch maybe our more boring parts. Ah. So, you know, Anna and I can be pretty boring. True. We're not going to drone on and on about stuff. Yeah. So please enjoy this best of episode. We're very excited. Let's begin. Well, well, well. Wow, that was a nice little head spin. Yeah. Who are you? I am Andrew. Everyone, <laughs> my brother, Andrew Burkell, for the first time ever, is appearing on Jojo Mayhem. Okay, I was going to say, I've been on videos before, but... Yeah. So I think that we should spend most of our time today telling some stories and memories from growing up together. I think that's a good idea. And... We have quite a few. I think we should begin... With the time that I made you into a human pulley system so that you could dunk the basketball. I'd like to hear your perspective. I've told this story a million times. You have. I tell it in every speaking engagement I do. Yeah. Hannah, you know, we do speeches together and she loves to make fun of like how unsafe this was. Um, but why don't you go ahead and sure. tell the story as you remember it? <laughs> I feel like we have to start with saying why we wanted to do it. Uh, yes. So growing up, our friend Pat, uh, he had a basketball hoop. Um, one of those where you could adjust the height of it. Um, and we also had the small little urban rebounder trampolines where if we put the basketball hoop all the way down and used the trampoline, we could like, Maybe dunk. I a forgot bit. about that just, trampoline. Just barely. I totally forgot about the trampoline. And like, so we were playing basketball all the time. And of course, dunking is like the coolest thing you can do as a human being. Yeah, and how old were we around this time? You were probably nine, I ten. I was going to say, yeah, somewhere in that nine, in that ten, age. eleven range. So I would have been. Shane's 12, Pat's 10 or 11. Yeah. We're um, kids. We want to dunk, a real dunk, like on a 10 foot hoop. Not using the, the trampoline. Not using the trampoline, correct. So. Being like four feet tall, four and a half, I don't know how tall you are at nine. Um, you can't dunk at that age. Uh -huh. But if you have someone who can pull you up with a rope, you can dunk. <laughs> and so we thought, hmm, Andrew's a little smaller. He'll be the, the guinea pig. Uh, let's tie a really thick. raspy, thick, not nice rope around his waist. I always say it was like a knot hole. Yeah, uh, so one that of you those on a ship. Correct, and w one that had been used often. So there were a lot of little pieces sticking out all over the place. All thorns. Yeah, it didn't feel good. We and tie it around your waist. Tie it around my waist. Doesn't feel good already. <laughs> and then loop it up over the basketball hoop. Through the hoop, I believe. Through the hoop, somewhere up. T yeah, it would have to be that way. Down to Shane's chair. Tied to my chair. Tied to the front so that he could. Continue watching and still and reverse yep. to pull us back up instead of like turned around driving away. He won't be able to see the dunk. Um, so it was really about my pleasure of seeing yeah, the dunk. I'm sure that that came up a lot. <laughs> and I start going up. It, it is working, it's, which is amazing. Which is amazing. As 11 year olds, figuring it's like out we it, are physicists, we are scientists, we're right? engineers, and we deserve compensation we, for this. We do, we are set for a lifetime of. Riches and inventions and patents. Yes. <laughs> and right after that, we get stuck, sort of. We did. We it. get up about halfway. You're almost, well, you're pretty high. We're close. But and then we hear some screaming, uh -huh. um, which was our dad, I believe. Because <laughs> you can see their backyard from our backyard when we were growing up. And I'm sure he looked over and saw, hmm. My son's in the air. He's hovering. And he is connected to the wheelchair. That's not good. So he runs over, 
Um, all the while, Shane's still trying to back up because we're at the point where, like, uh, well, we no. probably understood pulleys better back then, but I don't understand them now. It's easier in the beginning once you get up towards the... The apex, The I apex, believe. yeah, the fulcrum. The f- um, it gets harder, so there's more pressure on the wheelchair. I'm in full reverse. Full reverse. My wheels, wheels are spinning. spinning. I'm there's sure like there was smoke, smoke coming out. Um, Pat's, like, yanking on my chair yeah, to, to give me some get a extra little power. Extra. Still didn't get up. And then dad begins to scream. Dad begins to scream, tell right. us to stop, because he sees the wheelchair, <laughs> knowing that it's getting screwed up. And we broke the wheelchair. Well, oh, yeah, you jumped right to it. And I don't even really know if I dunked. I, I You feel never like dunked, I, no. I don't. I think I just blocked that part out because it was so traumatizing. Yeah. I never got to dunk. But you kind of skimmed over the biggest, like, piece of it here. As we lowered Andrew down, we saw that my wheelchair could only turn mm. one direction. Like, I could only turn in a circle. Couldn't drive straight, couldn't yep. turn the other way. All of that, like, effort that my chair was giving, all that smoke, was the motors in my chair destroying themselves. Mm-hmm. Like, melting. Like, yeah. They were toasted. And the replacement cost of that was, like, $8,000. Yeah. It was a lot. Quite a bit. So we were, we might have been drowned for a few days. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> but no ropes it, for a couple days. No more ropes, guys. Yeah. <laughs> was it worth it? Do you think? Absolutely. You can only learn through failure in life. Wow. That is that is one thing that I live by. That, <laughs> you fail forward. You don't fail back. These are life lessons. You fail forward, Andrew Berha. All right. So these are all kind of our jet yard mayhem sports stories. You know, us being silly mm-hmm. kids. You are a adult. I'm an adult. Um, Sometimes. Yeah, mostly. So I'm going to switch from kind of all the silly to a little bit more serious now. Are you going to be able to handle that? For a short amount of time. I can maybe give you a couple minutes. All right. You're allowed to Two, still three. joke, but let's keep it with a level of seriousness. Okay. Um, as you know, Hannah and I are YouTubers now, podcasters. You are. We, are you familiar? No. We're being grubs on okay. YouTube. A uh, little over a million followers. Wow. Thank you. Like and subscribe. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and as we've been doing that over the last four or five years, you know, our family knows, that a very common reaction that we get to our videos is this assumption and the assertion that Hannah and I are not in a real relationship, that I am either paying her or she's using me or, you know, there's a a myriad Mm -hmm. number of theories about how we are fake and not in love. And all of those ideas are based on the presumption that I am not a valuable partner i could never be a lovable husband for hannah i'm gonna get like your take on everything about that mm. and just like what you how you feel how does that make you feel as my brother well to start off uh you're not a good lover <laughs> i'm just gonna throw that out there um no i mean a lover was the weirdest word it was the one that i just... i chose very carefully <laughs> Um, but yeah, obviously growing up, we experienced that as well. Just not, we weren't lovers. Just want to throw that out there. Um, just people seeing you drive around and I think they, they would just judge because they wouldn't understand it. And they I think underestimate. They right? underestimate you and they just, they paint the picture in their head. And I think the biggest thing whether it was our childhood or your your and Hannah's career and life mm-hmm. together, I think the for society it's a lot easier to if you don't understand something, paint your own picture in your head. You make your own narrative. Mm-hmm. When you don't understand something, it's so much easier than going out of your way to change your viewpoint and your understanding and educate mm-hmm. yourself. It's so much easier to just not do that and paint your own picture in your head, yeah. which is what people do. And it's 
it has to be human nature because people just do that. It's some people, not everyone. <laughs> correct. Yeah, I guess I'm not. I'm painting society in a very bad light. Yeah, this is there a are, small subset. There of are society. people who <laughs> who choose to do that rather than figure out what is going on uh-huh. and and whether it's you guys or anything. Yeah, I think that you guys are doing a really good job with your your videos and everything that you're doing with um, work to be that education for people oh, that you. it's okay <laughs> to be different. It's okay that things don't look like the, the norm that you're used to seeing Yeah, doesn't make them wrong yep. or bad or fake or fake. <laughs> it is just different. And I feel like as a whole, we are shifting towards being able to have, I mean, there's all different people are being, Embraced. Embraced yeah. and being represented way more than they ever have been at this point in, yeah. in society. And you guys are part of that in terms of educating people. This is so heartfelt. I, I'm grating my teeth together so hard right now. I'm, I'm trying my as best. As soon as they tear this, this off, just, this is just bad. I'm, I'm just getting punched. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. You can't believe you made me say that. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I appreciate that sincerely. I don't mean it. What has been your kind of like... Like putting the YouTube stuff aside, perspective or like thoughts on my relationship with Hannah. Like you've been there every step of the way, you know. Yeah. You used to be one of my primary caregivers, and then as Hannah and I fell in love, like she took that over as we began spending mm. more and more time together. And now we live together. What's yeah. like? Well, I mean, I. I remember, Other than the fact that you're like really proud of me. Well, yeah. Yeah, none of that is actually true. <laughs> Um, I remember when you left, I feel like for both of us, it was really hard that day when you made that call to move you oh were, my you God. Were to Minnesota. That yeah. was a really difficult day for both of us because it was the end of an era. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember the first thing you said to me, I sat you down in the basement and I was like telling you about yeah. it. And the first thing you said was, so can I have your Xbox? <laughs> <laughs> I needed the Xbox. I needed to make sure that I could still play my video games. Um, but no, I, I in my best man speech, um, I, I had thought of a good way to. Andrew is my best man. At, to describe writer. how I felt about you guys, mm-hmm. um, and I had I had described a story about um, another time where you almost died. This time, not my fault, thankfully, um, but just a really scary moment in our life. Yeah. Um, where you had no one to take care of you and I had to rush home to make sure that nothing bad happened. Right. And knowing you and knowing Hannah and the person that she is and how well she takes care of you, I have never felt that fear in the years that you've been gone that right. there's not good care or there's going to be a chance of you being home alone and something really bad happening. Right. Um I've never had that uncomfortableness while you've been gone of not knowing if you were going to yeah. be taken care of properly <laughs> or even like kept alive. <laughs> like, um, this I've, is a testament to him. Yeah. You know how incredible she is as a person. For sure. Yeah. And it, it fills me with a lot of joy to know that I don't have to worry okay. about you and know that you are having a really good, productive and happy life out here with her, even if it is a thousand miles away, <laughs> I'll take it. And in the coldest place and ever. in the coldest place, which I always seem to visit in the winter. Yeah, you I don't, never come in the summer. I, come, I came once in yeah, the summer. It's way better in the summer. It is. Well, that was the most heartfelt thing I've ever And you'll heard. never get anything like that. I have it on video, again. so I have it now. Well, I will go take the check that you offered me <laughs> when we're done with this. But see, now that you say that, the trolls are going to be like, I know, it's see, perfect. See, he actually is paying. I am. Huh? He is. <laughs> if you've ever seen any of our videos, you probably know that Hannah is the most indecisive person on the planet. I don't know about that. I am. I struggle to make decisions, I'll admit it. So you can imagine how difficult it is for me to choose a doctor. I mean, how are you even supposed to go about that? You should use ZocDoc. They make it very easy. Yes. When I found out about ZocDoc, I realized I can finally pick a doctor. All the information is in one place. I'm ready to go. 
ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. They take all the difficulty out of decision making. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance, are located near you, and treat basically any condition you're searching for. Plus, the typical wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between just 24 to 72 hours. That's it. You can even score same-day appointments. ZocDoc is a fantastic option for finding and picking great doctors in your area. Go to ZocDoc.com junkyard and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash junkyard. ZocDoc dot com slash junkyard. Hello, welcome back. Today we are joined by disability advocate Hannah Elward. Joined. I'm here every week, except for one. Yeah, but you're putting on your disability advocate hat. Oh, okay. We and all, we're also joined, we also joined by disability advocate Shane Burkhoff. Not advocate, just disability. <laughs> We're joined by disability. By this disability. By disabled chamber. Right here. Uh, yeah, so we're going to break down some of the common misperceptions that people have about disability. These ideas are nefarious because ultimately they lead to real obstruction to the human rights of disabled people. Yeah. So there are real implications here. Absolutely. All right. Just to start it off on a real heavy note, <laughs> uh, this is impression. This is <laughs> awful. All right, let's begin. Number one, living with a disability is a tragedy that deserves pity. I feel like that one should be self-explanatory, but in case it isn't, obviously we have an idea in society that being disabled is a terrible thing. And so disabled people therefore need to be treated with pity. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many times in my life someone has come up to me and apologized mm -hmm. for what I have to go through or someone said Or like some, they're perceived what you have to go through. You yeah, know, it's yeah, not yeah. like they see something happen yeah. to you and they're like, I'm so sorry. It's like they see you in the grocery store and they're like, I'm so sorry. Yeah, or how people will give me gifts because they believe that my life is so miserable. I'm talking about strangers. Yeah. I don't mean like my parents give me gifts. <laughs> I mean like strangers come up to me. Money sometimes. In public and hand me money. 20 bucks one time. Tickets to events. Yeah. You know, a little candy, <laughs> which I probably shouldn't have accepted. Uh, I did. Um, and, and they're doing it at, to be kind, but it's based on the idea that like, was it the kid in the wheelchair? He must be having a pretty rough time. Let me give him a gift to make his day. I remember on our first ever date, uh, we were at a little diner and halfway through a woman from another table got up and came over and began to pray very loudly. Scream pray. It was screaming, scream praying uh, over Shane, holding onto his head, actually. It wasn't really over him so much as through him. I yeah, I was being it was very shocking. Uh, but she was screaming like healing prayers and uh, everyone in the restaurant was watching, which was mortifying. Uh, and then Shane said, thank you, but I actually have a very happy life. Please stop doing that. And she thought about it for a second. Like she was taken aback and she said, oh, that's not how I meant it. I was like, actually, it's exactly how you meant it. That just refuted your entire prayer because you were like, Lord, give him a better life. And he just said he's happy. So Yeah, I and mean, it's, it's easy to kind of understand how this idea came to be the prevailing idea of mm -hmm. disability. Our media tells pretty much only negative stories about disability. Yeah. You know, we see someone get injured and become paralyzed and it's portrayed as the worst possible thing that can happen to a human being. Well, I think the way it's usually portrayed in the media is also like this happened to this person. Can you believe that they're still smiling? Yeah. Like this person got injured and somehow they have still found the will to live, you know, and this happens again and again. And at no point have we thought, huh, like most people who become disabled have a will to live. Like maybe this isn't the... You know, the, the thing exception. that we yeah. keep saying, like, wow, wow, wow. But, like, at a certain point, it's just how it is, you know? 
And obviously people do have negative experiences with disability and becoming injured, but that's the only thing that we ever hear about in the media. And that's not really the norm of the lived experiences. If you look at studies that examine the quality of life of disabled people, it's no different than non-disabled people. Yeah. Um, you know, disabled people are, there's people that love their lives and there's people that are less overall satisfied. Yeah. Um, but there's Which is normal, yeah. Yeah, there's certainly not a significant, like, tendency Disparate, towards yeah. uh, having a bad life. Mm -hmm. um, people, just like in the general population, aren't thinking about their disability 24-7, you know, yeah, and in a that, negative way. The thing that bothers me so much is we have hundreds of hours of video about our life together online that people hunt and consume. And if you watch any of that footage, you should come away with the idea that we have a wonderful life. Like we have things that make us happy. We travel, we work, we have found success. We have love. You see all that. And yet people still leave comments every day. that are like, Oh, I feel so bad for him. Mm -hmm. He can't move. <laughs> yeah. Like, Look at how happy I am. I know. I, I, <laughs> It doesn't make sense. Yeah, makes my brain fizz a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so that is misconception number one. Number two is pretty related. Yes, this is very related. Disabled people are brave slash heroic slash inspirational for living their lives. And now I am brave. Okay, Shane, brave about what? What exactly have you been brave about in the last? Give me a scenario. The last week? No, I want to think of. Just tell me one time you were brave. This morning. <laughs> I woke up and made a choice okay. that I will not let my wretched, wretched tragedy of a disability bring me down. Mm -hmm. Is that, and then you ate the eggs Benedict and the tater tots? Is that Was that the, the brave choice? I decided to wake up and put a smile <laughs> on my face. And go to breakfast. And carry on. Okay. Despite it all. Mm-hmm. I'm going to confuse a lot of people right now. I know. They're like, wait, what? Is this the misconception? What? what? No, this is very related to the last one. So when you see people with disabilities as a sad thing that you should feel bad about, and then you see a disabled person at the mall, you might think, oh, wow, they're at the mall. Like, this is so sad and yet so amazing and heartwarming that they are out here at the mall. Instead of at home crying. Yeah. In the same way that I'm also at the mall, you know, it's... <laughs> It's remarkable. You're very brave. But yeah? the fact that they are at the mall is just so amazing and inspirational to me. You know, it's the same thing as those posters that you might see of a disabled person, you know, running a marathon. And or a kid like playing hops arch and he yeah. has a prosthetic limb. Yeah, something like that. Uh, and it says, no excuses. You know, so you see a disabled person doing the very same thing you're doing. And yet it's supposed to somehow motivate you, you know, to 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 look at your life differently. Like, yeah, wow, you, you should be so have, yeah, yeah. so grateful for what you have because their life is so, so bad. I have got, this is a dead, I can't tell you yeah. how many times someone has come up to me in public. This is a bad one. And literally said, like often with tears in their eyes, <laughs> that they are so happy and so inspired to see me out in the world. Yeah. Period. There is no more qualification. Not for the work you've done. I read your books. No, no, no. No, it's nothing about my professional career. Yeah. It's simply that I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds so ridiculous in today's day and age, but it's generally older people who fall into this way of thinking. And it's because disabled people were locked away in institutions and care facilities and not seen by the general public years ago. And so now that we are, you know, getting more resources and access in the world, and we are able to like go to the grocery store, yeah, um, it, it's a new site for some of the non-disabled population. I will say though, I you know, I agree that in person it does tend to be older people who come up, but if you see, there's so many inspiration porn. That's like what this is referred to: inspiration porn videos online you'll see like on Instagram or like TikTok, there's a lot of comments from young people being like, this is so amazing that, you know, this girl with Down syndrome was asked to the prom. Yeah. You know, this is so incredible that someone would 
you know, even think to include her, you yeah. know, stuff like that. And it, it, so it, it's it's like reinforcing it for every generation. We just keep seeing it again and again. The way we see it on our YouTube channel most often is people leaving comments that say, wow, if he can get a woman, oh, yeah. if he can have a wife, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. And the assumption there is, again, my life is so bleak, so miserable, so sad, that there should be no way that I have a wife yeah. who loves me. I should not deserve that. Yeah. I figured out some, you know, miraculous loophole. <laughs> you know, I, I'm brave. I'm inspirational for this. Um, and whereas, like, they being the much more valuable and worthy non-disabled person. Yeah. Can't find love. Well, those are usually said with a little bit of hatred toward you also. But people also say, wow, I love that Shane still has a sense of humor or that he's able to joke around. Like people will say that a lot. And I just think, you know, they, they again, expect you to be upset because of this idea that disabled lives are negative. Mm -hmm. it, it's like the same two things again and again. And yet... <laughs> They see it. So like these videos go around every day. If you go on Facebook right now, I'm sure you can find a video that reinforces inspiration porn. Like we see it every day and yet no one has thought, wow, maybe disabled people are just like doing regular things. Yeah. I, I How many times can you see it before you're like, maybe this isn't really inspirational to me anymore? A great way that you can kind of counteract this if you if you are realizing that maybe you do fall into this way of thinking. Yeah. Follow more disabled people. You know, there are plenty of disabled creators and influencers out there that you can follow to A, be entertained, yeah. but B, to learn about their experiences. Yeah. And all the ones that we follow, many of them, like, they make content that shows how amazing how cruel their life is. And then when yeah. you start to see these videos that go around, you're going to be like, this is, this feels weird now. Yeah. You know, so if you see a video of kids playing on a playground and one of them is disabled and it's, you know, the point is that it's heartwarming that there's a disabled child being included. You know, if all those kids weren't disabled, would you think that that's a heartwarming video or is that just kind of weird to post a video of kids on a playground? Maybe disabled people should just be Included, and it doesn't need to be a remarkable thing. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Something to think about. Mm -hmm. All right, we have two more misconceptions. All right, the next one. Caregiving is always an immense burden, and those who care give should be glorified and praised for their selflessness. All right, caregiver, how do you feel about that one? Well, this one irritates me quite a bit. I think you can find examples of this in our comment sections of people either saying, I'm making a terrible choice by being married to Shane and ruining my life with caregiving, or saying it's so amazing of me to make this sacrifice to be married to Shane and to care give. And important caveat before we talk more about this one, we are not saying that caregiving is never hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. For some people it is. Yeah. But again, by and large, it is not a rule that yeah. caregiving must be an immense burden. That's the thing. It simply is not true. It's like if we thought about, you know, par parenting, like having kids is a horrible, horrible choice. And anytime you had kids, someone was like, that's going to ruin your life. <laughs> it's just like, a, it's very weird. Like, yes, yeah, some people, it's, it's often very difficult having kids. There's a lot of really hard parts about it, whatever. But that's not like the what we should have is the overwhelming idea of like, like the main story. having <laughs> kids. Yeah. It's the same kind of thing where why would you have that be the narrative? Would you say on the spectrum of caregiving, yeah. from like least involved to most involved, you probably fall on the higher end of that scale with my care? You think? Well, compared to like... I was going to say lower end. Yeah, really? Well, that, that's a, a perfect example of how <laughs> Hannah feels. But I feel like my level of care, even though it's like fairly minimal... You need to do things like get me on the toilet. I think it's and, middle. I think it's middle because okay. I think it could be a lot more... Like if you had medical equipment that needed to be like adjusted every 15 minutes. Are you saying that my wheelchair is not metal? No, it doesn't need to be adjusted. I'm just saying I feel like there's things that could be like time sensitive and you don't really have any of that, you know? My basic point was that Hannah does, performs a level of care for me that I think many people feel like is like the top of the caregiving spectrum. Yeah, And yet true. Hannah as you just heard, <laughs> reports that it's the low end or maybe the middle. Yeah. Caregiving for us is seamlessly incorporated in our day. When we wake up together, 
Hannah and I get to be dressed and get ourselves dressed. Like, we eat breakfast together so that Hannah can help me take bites. Yeah, and I think a lot of people who don't have experience with caregiving will kind of equate it to having kids. You know, like pa- pa- people who have well, kids I've are like animals before. Okay, like having a pet. <laughs> okay. That's always lovely to hear. <laughs> but I'm just saying, people who don't have experience are like, "Hmm, what is this like?" It's like having kids, and so they think to themselves, "Oh my god, I could never have kids and care give for like another kid." I I don't know, or like worse than kids. I don't yeah. know what they're thinking, <laughs> but we get that a lot of like, "I could never ever do that." And I think people are thinking about it in a very specific way of like, Shane is not contributing anything right, yeah. to the relationship. I am only dependent. Would, right? Yeah. Like how could <laughs> Hannah handle him and a kid? Like we get that all the time, but Shane is an equal partner in the relationship. So he's getting a lot of stuff done throughout yeah. the day that I think people aren't giving him credit for. Like I have a lot of free time. <laughs> I'm one of the lazier people that you might meet. I'm not a go-getter. <laughs> I enjoy leisure. Uh, and Shane does a lot of stuff during the day and the hours and hours that... That you're lounging. That I'm <laughs> trying to escape from doing work. Our life would not be afloat if it were not for me. I am proud to say that. That's true. Shane keeps everything afloat. Uh, so yeah, I just I, I think that they have a very skewed perspective of what Shane does and what I do. Yeah, and again, I think that really comes back to the stories that our media tells. Yeah. When we see caregivers in movies and... In books, they are giving up <laughs> wonderful things to partake in the kind of selfless, act, selfless yeah. act of taking care of someone. Yeah. It's seen as a sacrifice. Yeah. And for us and many other interabled couples that we know. It's just not in that category. It's not in that category. It's yeah. just a part of their life and not something that either individual feels like is a burden or a sacrifice. Yeah. Ready to move on? Number four. This is the big boy. Number four. This is the big boy. Disabled people don't have sex or intimacy or romance. Not true. Not true. <laughs> this is another one that you can find in the comment sections of our videos. People. If you want to learn about misconceptions, <laughs> just take just a look. Peruse our YouTube comment section. I wouldn't do that <laughs> if I were you. Um, but man, do people think that Shane and other any disabled person? can't has have sex or doesn't want to yeah, so i don't as asexual being yeah in in like a mandated i don't know in what way they think you can't i guess physically i guess they think that like your physical organs wouldn't function well that and they see my attraction yeah my, my ability to attract yeah a partner as non-existent. True. So it kind of goes hand in hand. And even if you did, it wouldn't work. Right. There's no physical way. Because yeah. we get a lot of like, there's no physical way that they could, so they're lying. Yeah. And again, caveat. I, I shouldn't have to say these caveats. I know. Obviously, there are disabilities that affect sexual function. Yeah. But that is not the rule. Yeah, exactly. That is not the overwhelming majority. All of these. I mean, yeah. we're not saying that any of these are never true. Of yeah, course, everything right. that we're saying is true for some people. Um, but it's just the fact that this is how we frame it, you know, point blank in yeah. society is the problem. Yeah. Um, when Hannah and I began our channel, we never really considered the idea that people would question our intimacy, our love, yeah. our romance. And boy, did they. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the biggest, like, I mean, hold them criticisms but they're more just troll comments yeah that we get or that we got in the beginning was like there is no way that you two are having sex and you're lying to the world <laughs> saying that you do because disabled people cannot you know do that do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i also see a lot of comments kind of from us like i'll get some that are saying like it's inappropriate that i would be intimate with you you know like in a in a way like people have called me a pedophile yeah like because you're smaller like there's no way like that that should be like yeah, illegal that's not what pedophile means everyone no it's not what pedophile means <laughs> um and uh i often see that like we get comments that are like if this if the roles the genders were reversed this would be illegal meaning like a disabled woman and a, a non-disabled man that would be illegal it's just wild to me that people think that disabled people can't consent 
to intimacy. And I think that kind of policing happens a lot more with mental disabilities, but it also does happen with physical disabilities where people say, you know, that that should be illegal to I mean, have sex with a disabled person. Yeah, which goes back to all of these yeah. misconceptions that disabled people are not kind of whole autonomous beings. Yeah, or adults at all, you know, or shouldn't adults. be considered adults. And this is going to sound silly, but disabled people can have sex. Mm-hmm. They can be amazing romantic partners. Yeah. You know, like pat me on the back as I'm saying all this. Um, I'm patting shit on the back. If you're they listening. can be really good at sex. Um, <laughs> you know, that we are just as sexual as our non-disabled counterparts. Yeah. Um, and that is the overwhelming rule. Yeah. Uh, not the opposite. Not the opposite. I remember uh, this is going back a couple of years to when I was in college. Also, it's going to be my fifth college reunion next year. Can you believe that? I'm so grown. You're all invited. I'm seriously an adult now. Um, but going back to my senior year of college, I was writing my senior thesis about disability misconceptions. Huh. Uh, I know. Speak of the you devil. You should have just read that paper today. <laughs> I should have. <laughs> um, but one of the things that it, I was interviewing about 40 physically disabled people. And one of the things that came up again and again in misconceptions was this intimacy thing. Uh, and so I was reading a lot of papers about disability and intimacy. And I remember, I I read a lot of stuff, but one thing stuck out to me that I still remember. And it was a paper about, I think it was spinal cord injuries. Like, I think it was just about that. Um, But I remember there was one woman in that paper who said that after she became injured, um, I don't remember where her injury was on her spine. I don't know if it was just like waist down, but it was, I think it was like chest down because I remember her saying that after her injury, her body like created new pleasure areas on her body. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were way more intense than she had had before the injury. And so her sex after the injury was a lot more vibrant. I'll use that word. I can't remember what she said, but it was, it was, she had intense, yeah, better, better intimacy after her injury because of the way her body adjusted. In the book that Hen and I are writing right now, where we're interviewing um, other interval couples, it's something that we've heard time and time again that disability actually enhances their intimacy because mm-hmm. it requires more communication, it requires creativity. Yeah. And those things help out in the bedroom. Um, yeah. Well, it's funny because well, you see all those studies about heterosexual couples uh, that, like, the women don't have it's always bad it's always yeah it's what i wish i had it in front of me like i should have prepared for this with this but it's something like 60 percent of women don't orgasm when they have sex in a heterosexual big number is it six it might have been like 40 or yeah 60 percent don't it's something around there it's a lot of people don't and then i wish i remember the numbers but i know that in lesbian relationships it's higher like it's a lot higher way way higher maybe like 80 90 percent like that they do yeah exactly that it's way more pleasurable for the woman women in the relationship in that case and i would love to see a study about either just like disability in relationships or interable relationships i would love to see the ranked pleasure of the people in those relationships because i really feel like it would be way, way higher. Yeah. Like on par with the queer relationships in that study. I thoroughly believe that my disability makes our sex life better. Yeah. Um, and this is a topic that like we don't want to give too many personal details. Yeah. But like it has required more communication, more creativity yeah. to find ways that work well for us. Yeah. And those ways work well for us. Yeah, um, exactly. And so, you know, without kind of that need to experiment differently, we probably never would have arrived at those new I know. kind of ways of doing things that are great for us. Well, clearly a lot of people don't if you look <laughs> at that study. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so this is another one that like, it's kind of one of the main points of our channel that, you know, an interrelated relationship is just as full of passion and romance and love as any other. Yeah. Um, Again, not the story that we are getting in our society. Not at all. So (laughs) those are our misconceptions. Yeah. There are so many more uh, out there in the world that we could do hours on this topic. I know. We'll save more for the future. Um, But we hope that this made you think 
and analyze how you perceive disabled people. Yeah. Um, and take it to heart. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back. Thank you to our sponsor, Every Plate, for sponsoring this episode. We are all super busy during the holiday season, but Every Plate can help you make meal times easier without compromising on quality. Every Plate recipes include only the highest quality ingredients, including sustainably sourced seafood that meets the Monterey Bay Aquarium seafood rankings, so you know your meals will be fresh and flavorful. Yeah, nothing was worse than coming home from a long day of shopping and realizing that you don't have anything for dinner. Every Plate makes sure that that never happens. You can save even more time with their quick and easy recipes, including easy cleanup options and ready in 30 minutes or less meals. They plan the meals and deliver pre-portioned ingredients right to your door so you spend less time meal prepping and more time resting and relaxing over the holidays. Every Plate also offsets 100% of their delivery emissions and their meals have a 31% lower carbon footprint on average than supermarket meals of the same portion. Plus, nearly all packaging materials are curbside recyclable in most areas in the U.S. And what sets every plate apart from other meal kits is its lower price point. With all the money that we save, we can buy lots more Christmas presents for each other. That's true. Like, you can get a lot more for me. And you can get a lot more for me. Well, get started with every plate for just one forty nine per meal, plus $1 stakes for life by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49JunkyardPod. Subscription must be active to qualify and redeem $1 stake. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal, plus $1 stakes for life by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and enter in code 49JunkyardPod. Subscription must be active to qualify and redeem $1 stake. All right, we are back, and now we are going to tell you about the true drama from the week. <laughs> Shane's, I don't even know what to call it. Shane's descent into yeah panic, yep, misery, uh huh, fear, uh huh, chaos. Wow, Judge mayhem. Do you want to tell them about it? That should be our new like tagline. No fear. No misery. No chaos. Nope. Judge mayhem. No. It began. Well, no. All right, we need to get contacts here. (laughs) I have a very specific way of assisting myself to chew my food. Mm -hmm. If you're listening and not watching, it's going to be hard to demonstrate visually for you. Yeah. But basically, I, with the help of someone else, prop my arms and kind of my wrists under my own chin. Yeah to act as a assistant for my chewing mechanism. And then, yeah, and then you push down on your wrists and it makes your jaw stronger. Can you describe what it's like getting my arms in that position? <clears throat> yeah, so you have to put Shane's elbow in a certain spot on his armrest and then the other elbow in a certain spot on his armrest, two elbows, and then the hands meet under his chin and what holds them there is one thumb kind of under the other wrist. And yeah. then the thumb has to be in a very specific spot to, you know, balance correctly for Emph- all the pressure that he's going to put on them. Emphasis on specific spot. Yeah. Um, this kind of feels like building a house of cards when we're positioning my arms. Yeah. Hannah is a veteran and, you know, can do this in – Three seconds. Yeah. You know, Andrew, my brother who was here helping take care of me while Hannah was in San Diego, has done this, but it's been 10 years, seven, eight years. And you used to put your thumb there yourself at the bottom and then... You would pull your arms up, like someone would help pull your arms up. Yeah, like but the as thumb, I've gotten a little bit here, it's, The thumb yeah. thing is not new. It's been like years and years. Mm-hmm. But I don't think Andrew ever really did like the he, thumb placement. Yeah, you're right. He may not have. He just did like arm placement. So you probably imagine where this might be going. But it's so much worse than what you think. <laughs> um, on day one, when Andrew arrived, Hannah's gone. It became time. Well, it was before Andrew arrived. It was with my mom. True. Oh, my God. I forgot yeah. about that. Okay. So Shane texts me. This is while I'm probably on the plane still. I had left at 9.15 a.m. 
And so we, Shane hadn't eaten breakfast yet or anything. And he was going to eat with my mom after she dropped me off at the airport. So at like 11 or so, I get a text from Shane saying I was trying to have noodles for breakfast or something. Um, but I couldn't get my arms into the right spot with your mom. Like we just couldn't figure it out. So I ended up eating with my arms down and I didn't eat a lot. Like annoying. Yeah. This has happened like speckled throughout the last five years, like randomly here and there. I'll just be yeah. tired one day. And like it does take a lot of my energy and strength to keep my arms in that position. Yeah. You know, the positioning is very important, but then I have to use energy to hold my arms there. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I figure I didn't sleep a lot the night before Hannah left because we were stressed and we were busy and waking up early. Um, so I'm probably tired. I know very well how to describe to someone how to put my arms in this position. Yeah. So like, and your mom has done it before. Yeah. So like, it didn't feel like an error of positioning. Yeah. I was just like, yeah, I'm tired. That's weird. Later that night, the same thing happens to Andrew and I. Yeah. And this one felt more like, okay, Andrew is just new to this. He hasn't put my arms up is how we refer to it. So maybe it's just the thing of like, I'm not describing it the right way. But we were at a restaurant and it was pretty frustrating. Like he would get my thumb right where it needed to be and my thumb would just give way. Yeah. Making my arms fall and making it very difficult for me to eat a meal. Like I can't chew more than a few bites without my arms helping me. Mm -hmm. So again, I text Hannah. I'm like, okay, like another meal didn't really work out. Like I didn't have a whole lot because yeah. my arms wouldn't stay up. And at that point, I'm like, Shane, you need to sit down and figure out how to get your arms up. Uh -huh. Like I, now two people have tried. I don't think you're giving it your best shot. Like you need to figure this out. Just sit there and do it again and again until you yeah. get it, you know? Because you were like, well, what did you have for dinner? Yeah. And I was like, um, wine. Yeah. And I'm <laughs> like, you need to be eating food this week. <laughs> the next few days didn't improve. Yeah. And it began to really scare me. Yep. I was certain, completely certain, that I was explaining to Andrew the correct way to put my arms up. Yeah. It felt like I was in the right position. And then they would fall. It just wasn't working. And I began telling Hannah, like, I, I know this is really weird timing, but I think I'm getting weaker. Mm -hmm. Like, that I have a progressive neuromuscular condition. And that's not what you said to I, me. <laughs> I've got, well, no, no, no. I'm just, I know. To the that audience. just sounded like it was all <laughs> yeah. the message you sent me. <laughs> Hannah, I have to tell you something. <laughs> I have a neuromuscular condition. <laughs> I get weaker. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I was beginning to really fret. And I was not because I was like, Shane, there is no way that this coincidence has occurred, that you suddenly, in an hour since I left, became way weaker and are staying that way. Like, there's just, I was like, I don't buy it. There's just no possible way. And you were like, well, that's how it is. Like, I'm weak now. And my brother, like, really, really wanted to figure this out like yeah. more than me after like three or four attempts of it not working i was the one that was like all right i'll just eat some like dip like yeah. soft softer food um because i didn't want him to think that it was his fault mm -hmm. and I, I just didn't want the awkwardness of it you know yeah. so rather than sitting there for a half hour trying or whatever i often was just like all right i'll eat something that's soft and make it easy yep Andrew was like, we can figure it out. Yeah. Like, come on. Inside my mind, though, I am, again, certain that I am getting weaker, that I will never be able to put my arms up to eat again. And I'm, like, envisioning my future now, like, planning. Okay, this means I need to always eat only soft food, or maybe I need to feed into tube again. And I'm freaking out. Yeah. And trying really hard not to, like, tell all this to Hannah a lot because, like, you know, don't want to worry her on her trip. But here and there, I was like, arms didn't work again. Yeah. It's happening. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the weakness is here to stay. Yep. So I'm getting these texts. I'm worried about it 
more in like Shane's not eating enough this week. Yeah. I don't know if I was really thinking like about your future. Um, <laughs> but I got home and at the, the minute I got home, I was like, Shane, like I'm going to try to put your arms up. Like I really, I can't believe. You're like kissed hello. And then yeah. she was like, all right, I'm going to try your arms. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe what you've been telling me. I need to see this for myself. Like, let me just do it. And Shane was like, no, I don't want you to do it. I didn't want to face the truth. Yeah. Cause you were like, it's not. It's not like it wasn't Andrew. It wasn't your mom. Like it was the fact that my arms no longer do this and I don't want to face that. And I was like, Shane, we have to try. Like we have to. So Shane, finally, we went in the bedroom alone. Like this is a big thing for Shane. I was very worried. You were so worried. We go in there. I put his arms up. They kind of like flop at first. And I'm like, no, the thumb just wasn't in the right spot. You were like, see, see. Vindication. Uh huh. I do it one more time and they stay. They stay. And Shane was like, my jaw oh, dropped. Oh, yeah. My I've never seen dropped. you <laughs> in more shock than that. <laughs> and so I like put my arms down and, you know, we went about our night and then I, we ate dinner later. Yeah. And I was like, all right, try again. Yep. And they went up on the first try. Yep. And they stayed. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. For like a week, I was like shocked that it was worth it again. I know. So, you're still very grateful that it's working I'm again. I'm so happy. Every time it happens, you're like, wow, this is great. I, I visited the land of the wheat. Yep. And I returned okay. to the land of the strong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nope, still very weak. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it must have been some error in my explanation. Yeah. You know, something that felt like it was right, but like you know yeah. isn't right, but Andrew and your mom wouldn't have noticed that. Yep. I don't know. But basically the the grand conclusion here is that you need to give seminars yes. to everyone in our network. Yeah. About how to put my arms up. We should probably sit down with my mom and like show her. <laughs> you know, I should do it with her. Like a hands-on, our fun. hands together. With my dry, dry ointment yeah. hands. Now they're not even sweaty, so you'll be even stickier. Maybe that was it. Maybe. Because I didn't have my ointment then. Oh, well, you've never had your ointment before. So maybe it was my excessive sweat. Maybe it was. That ew. couldn't have helped. Ew, ew, ew. <laughs> Poor Andrew. <laughs> so that was like the the main drama yeah. of the week. Um and it was scary. Like, it was genuinely scary. Yeah. On my end, at least. On Hannah's end, she was like, it's just, you're not doing it right? Yeah. <laughs> I had a feeling. <laughs> but I'm, it, I knew it was scary for you. All right, everyone. If you enjoyed this podcast, or if you didn't, subscribe, yep. follow, review, like, star, five <laughs> star, comment. What is our, our outro going to be today, Shane? I don't know. The pressure of these is really building. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any? No, this is not my job. I take zero responsibility for how we exit our podcast. It is a jet yard out there filled with toilets just the way down your next beautiful selfie. <laughs> take it, post it, love it, Oh, bop it. All right, these go on too long. You need to learn brevity. Fear. Goodbye, everyone. Chaos. <laughs> Misery. Shut your mouth.